Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to the sixth session of Stakeholder Forum's Countdown to the UN SDG Summit 2023, series of webinars in the run-up to the September 2023 SDG Summit and the 2024 Summit of the Future. With the support of experts in each of the first 16 SDGs, we have been reviewing two SDGs each month. Uh, we began in November 2022 and will conclude in June 2023 in the run-up to the July 2023 United Nations High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development. The series continues to explore where we are in SDG implementation and to identify transformative actions for change with an emphasis on strengthening the environmental dimension of the 2030 Agenda. Today's focus will be on SDGs 11 and 12, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable, and ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. It has been organized by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future in connection with our proposed 2023 platform, an instrument to support greater and more effective stakeholder participation in the SDG 20. 23 summit uh, during this review cycle of the 2030 agenda for sustainable development during the 2023 United Nations HLPF. I'm Charles Newhan, chairman of Stakeholder Forum and your host today from New York. I'm joined today by today's moderator, Dr. David O'Connor, who is the permanent representative of the International Union of, for Conservation uh, of Nature to the United Nations, also joining us from New York. And as you can see on your screen, we have a panel of special guests who, with a diverse range of experiences and knowledge, will be introduced by David in the coming minutes. Now, for those of you not familiar with Stakeholder Forum, it is an international not-for-profit NGO in consultative status with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, commonly known as ECOSOC, since 1996. SF has, for more than 25 years, been working to advance sustainable development at all levels. SF seeks to provide a bridge between those who have a stake in sustainable development and the international forums where decisions are made in their name. Now, a bit of housekeeping before uh, I hand us over to our first speaker. Uh, please note that the webinar is being live streamed on YouTube, and a link to that recording will be posted on the Stakeholder Forum website soon afterwards. As you will see, attendee cameras and microphones are muted and will remain so throughout the webinar. We have over 700 people registered for the webinar. Uh, we typically get an upwards of 200 to 300 actual attendees. That's been the pattern. Now, there will be an opportunity for questions uh, from attendees near the end of the experts roundtable discussion time. Those questions should be submitted in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, not in the chat section. The chat section is for you to com communicate with each other. You can post links uh, to matters relevant to the webinar topic, and you can share your contact details with each other. We'll also save the chat and we'll share that with everybody. It'll be one of the, it'll be with the link that you get so that you can find other people's details, email addresses, or links to various uh, things that they have shared with us. Now, as far as the questions, the Q&A, all of you will be able to see them. Uh, you can scroll through them and you can upvote them. That is, if you see something that's a similar question that you would like to ask, rather than ask a separate question, give a thumbs up there, because what we'll do is we'll look at the questions that have lots of um, interest and try our best to answer those. Apologies, however, for not being able to answer all questions due to time constraints. Now, lastly, due to the breadth of the subjects we're addressing today, we have a greater number of speakers than usual. It is therefore likely that we could go on for up to two hours rather than the 90 minutes originally envisioned. So while the SF team hopes that our speakers and audience can remain with us, we'll completely understand if you cannot, because we had promised you 90 minutes to begin with. Now, uh, on with the program. We begin today with introductory comments from Jan Gustav Strandenes. Uh, he's our first speaker and began working with the UN on environment and governance in the 1970s. He has been lecturing about the UN for nearly 50 years, worked for NGOs at the United Nations in New York during the Commission on Sustainable Development years, and has carried out multiple assignments for UNEP. Earlier in his career, Jan Gustav worked as a diplomat for Norway's foreign office and Botswana and Uganda, and later on directed a large uh, aid and environmental NGO in Norway for two decades. Jan Gustav is a longtime member of Stakeholder Forum's Board of Directors and our Senior Advisor on Governance. 
He most recently achieved uh, as project manager the Toward Stockholm Plus 50 project, a joint initiative by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future and the Norwegian Forum for Environment and Development. Uh, Jan Gustav, you now have the floor. Thank you very much, Charles. And thank you for this introduction and good morning, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you are today. We can never remind ourselves enough of the interlinked nature of the SDGs. It is more than a philosophical way to understand and implement the 2030 Agenda. The overarching goal of the 2030 Agenda is transformative change, but not any change. Transformative change is based on the nine dimensions of the 2030 Agenda, which are all identified in the 2030 document. This change includes the social, economic, and environmental dimensions. The change dimensions are universal, people-centered, and planet-sensitive, and they are indivisible, integrated, and interlinked. The ultimate goal of the 2030 Agenda is simply a vastly better world, or as expressed already in paragraph one of the 1972 Stockholm Declaration agreed to at the UN Conference on the Human Environment, which said that we all have, and I quote, the fundamental right to freedom, equality, and adequate conditions of life in an environment of equality that permits a life of dignity and well-being. To accomplish this, it says, we must implicitly realize that we carry, and I quote, a solemn responsibility to protect and improve the environment for present and future generations. This is, also, in short, I would say the terms of reference for the 2030 Agenda. Today, 50 years after the Stockholm Conference, which also gave us UNEP, the right to a clean environment is, as we know, an established right by last year's UN General Assembly resolution. We have reached SDG 11 and 12 in our countdown series to this year's September Summit on the SDGs. We need to be reminded of the full text of the two goals, lest we should be tempted to live by abbreviations. SDG 11 is about make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. We are aware of this goal's background, but rem being reminded of a few facts will inspire us to be concrete when we address solutions. For most of human history, populations lived in very low density rural settings and urbanization is a trend unique to the past few centuries and urban settings are relatively a new phenomenon in human history. The UN estimated back in 2007 that this was the year when for the first time more people in the world lived in urban than in rural areas. More than half of the population now lives in urban areas and increasingly in high dense cities. In stark numbers, this means that more than 4 billion people live in urban areas globally. People tend to migrate from rural to urban areas as they become richer, and living standards tend to be higher in urban areas, but about 30% in urban areas globally live in slum households. As a consequence of this, inequality becomes highly visible. We also know that urban areas do leave behind large environmental footprints. By 2050, it's projected that more than two thirds of the world's population will live in urban areas, meaning that close to 7 billion people will be in these areas. This transition has transformed and continues to do so with the way we live, work, travel, and build all kinds of networks. SDG 11 has 10 targets. In a nutshell, these targets are meant to guide countries, municipalities, stakeholders to deal with the process of urbanization referred to above in rather simple but dramatic figures so that the overarching goal of transformative change can be accomplished. Harmonization, localization, and subsidiarity are issues connected to interlinkages. When problems and challenges become too large, we need predictability to solve them. And one way to do so is to compartmentalize issues. Interlinked solutions go the opposite way. In fact, the interlinked nature of the SDGs clearly demonstrates the synergies between all the goals and their targets. The modern concept of synergies or interlinkage, I would say, was first formulated by the philosopher Aristotle when he expressed the following, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, an apt description of the entire 2030 agenda. Let me give you a few examples of how SDG relates to other SDGs with a couple of quick examples. Target 11, six states 
And I quote, by 2030, reduce the adverse per capita environmental impact of cities, including by paying special attention to air quality and municipal and other waste management. Environmental impact speaks to SDG 6, 7, 9, 14, 15, and 17. Target 11, 7 states by 2030, provide, and I quote, universal access to safe, inclusive, and accessible green and public spaces, in particular for women and children, all the persons and persons with disabilities. It speaks directly and indirectly to goal three, five, six, nine, 14, and 15. I could go through every SDG and illustrate similar connections. The interlinked nature also touches on system-wide coherence within the UN family. UN Habitat with member states agreed to the new urban agenda a couple of years ago. Its declaration connects this directly to the 2030 agenda as well as UNEP. Paragraph 164 of that declaration is point in case, and I quote, we stress that the follow-up to and review of the new urban agenda must have effective lin linkages with the follow-up to and review of the 2030 agenda to ensure coordination and coherence for their implementation. Mahatma Gandhi said once, there is enough for everyone's need, but not for everyone's greed. We live in a world rich in resources, Still, it is. But we also know that the resource base is threatened by our enormous consumption. SDG 12 is all about ensure sustainable consumption and production pattern. It has 11 targets that if completely implemented has the force to fully change the lifestyles of humanity. Just try to grasp the dramatic content of target 12 too, viewed in every possible context of its nature. It says, by 2030, achieve the sustainable management and efficient use of natural resources. The content of this target is in stark contrast to what we are engaged in doing with the planet today. Let me give you a few consumption uh, facts. During the 20th century, our rate of consumption of Earth resources has increased by a factor of eight. We consume annually about 60 million tons of resources, and it is growing. Humanity now consumes as much organic material as is replenished by nature every year. The ecological balance of Earth is slowly being undermined by our behavior. Though the issue of production and consumption is hardly a new one, even for intergovernmental policy discussions, the world has struggled for years to come to grips with the way we produce and consume. The UN Conference on the Human Environment, which took place in Stockholm, Sweden in 1972, and which founded UNEP, was one of the first intergovernmental conferences, if not the first, to discuss consumption issues as it related to global human welfare, poverty and population, and the depletion of the planet's resources. This is also reflected in the Stockholm Declaration from the conference. Principle three, for instance, states that I quote, the capacity of Earth to produce vital renewable resources must be maintained and whatever practical restored or improved. And principle five of the same declaration says, it expands on this thought and says, the non-removal renewable resource of the earth must be employed in such a way as to guard against the danger of the future exhaustion and to ensure that benefits from such employment are shared by all mankind. The UN Conference on Environment and Development and Agenda 21 picked up this mantle and sustainable consumption and production, SCP, became household concepts, at least in theory. With the document from Rio Plus 20, our approach to the SCP issues began to change in a realistic manner, and paragraph 88 of the document authorizes UNIP as the implementing body to find a solution to our global consumption patterns. Political processes also need maturity, we know that, and SDG 12 encompasses experiences with work on SAP for the past 20 years. Comparing what is stated in Agenda, in agenda 21 and in the 2030 Agenda about consumption reflects this in a good way, and is explicitly shown by its 11 targets. This political maturity is also expressed in the interlinked nature of the 2030 Agenda. Target 12.3 refers to food waste and is waste and is connected to SDG 1, 2, and 3, an FAO. Target 12.4 is about chemicals and pollution, and we connect to goals 7, 13, 15, and UNEP. And as with SDG 11, we also see SDG 12 in connection with several of the MEAs 
that help us steer politics in a sound and sustainable direction. But we still have some way to walk. And as we find in SDG 17, we also find systemic challenges which need to be connected to all the other goals. Growth and economy underlie almost every future development plans. We need a new understanding to manage tr transformative change. The UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has made several prescient statements and challenges that we, about challenges we face. In his opening speech at the Stockholm Plus 50 conference last year, commemorating UNEP's 50th anniversary, he stated, global well-being is at risk. And it's in large part because we haven't kept our promises on the environment. Earth natural systems cannot keep up with our demands. And he continued, part of the solution lies in dispensing with gross domestic product as a gauge for countries' economic clout. And then the Secretary General continued, and he described the system as an accounting system that rewards pollution and waste. Governance has been referred to by many as the missing the 19th SDG, but governance issues are integrated in every SDG. Targets, <clears throat> targets uh, in 11 and 12 both state the need for participatory processes, and 12 too is almost a condensed version of principle 10 of the Rio principle, emphasizing the right to information and participation. We live in a fast changing world and our lifestyles are challenged also in good ways. A couple of days ago, a report calling for a four day work week was released. 61 companies and non-profit organizations in the UK had participated in the study, also practicing a four day week. The report showed that reducing the work week without cutting salaries broadly improved the productivity, work-life balance, turnover, and the overall well-being of staff. If this be the future of our everyday lives, what will our society be like? Will more freedom create new demands, differently planned municipalities, different consumption patterns? Such a change may be a dramatic change towards a better future for people, but also be a challenge to our environment. Such change will affect every target in SDG 11 and 12, and perhaps these targets may also guide us into the next phase of the 2030 Agenda, the 2060 Agenda for a better future. Let me finish my introduction with a quote again from Mahatma Gandhi, and which is about the core of the SDG goals, transformative change, and a challenge for the upcoming summit. He simply said, be the change that you wish to see in the world. Thank you for your attention. And Gustav, thank you so very much for that, uh, especially for the summary and the importance of the interlinkages uh, of the SDGs. Uh, now, uh, I'd like to ask you to welcome my colleague, Dr. David O'Connor, who will introduce our keynote speaker uh, and afterwards our panel of experts. David is a longtime friend of Stakeholder Forum and the permanent observer at the United Nations of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. Previously, he held the he helped the United Nations team and led it, uh, supporting substantially the UN General Assembly work, uh, Open Working Group, which crafted the Sustainable Development Goals. Before that, David worked for many years at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, uh, Development Center in Paris, addressing sustainable development challenges of emerging economies. He holds degrees from the University College London, the University of Wisconsin at Madison, and Yale University. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. And uh, thank you very much, Jan Gustav, for that inspiring and uh, insightful presentation, as always. Um, I would just like to uh, recall two quotes that you um, cited one from Aristotle, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, I think that is a very excellent encapsulation of the 2030 agenda and the SDGs. Um, and uh, both Charles and you have talked about the importance of understanding the interlinkages amongst them and how that affects how we go about implementing them. Um, and the second is Gandhi's, uh, we have enough for everyone's needs, but not for our greed. And I think that speaks uh, precisely to the challenge of sustainable consumption and production. How much is enough is, I guess, a question that 
people in the developed world uh, need to have enough for those basic. So on that note, I'm going to move to the panel. Um, we have uh, an excellent set of panelists um, speaking on both SDGs 11 and 12, and we have a keynote speaker. Unfortunately, the keynote speaker is not here at the moment, and so I will introduce him when he arrives, which will be closer to 8.30. So I'm going to move directly to our first speaker on SDG 11, on sustainable, inclusive, safe, uh, resilient cities. Uh, and introduce her. And that is Juliana Oliveira Cuna. Juliana is a policy economist at the International Growth Center of the, well, the London School of Economics, but it's also affiliated with Oxford University. Um, and this center is a global research center with a network of world leading researchers, country teams across Africa, South Asia, and the Middle East and a set of global policy initiatives. And at the IGC, Juliana has been working on urban, industrial, and labor market policy. And most pertinent to today's discussion, she is part of the Cities That Work initiative, which builds on IGC's work to translate economic research and practical insight into clear urban policy guidance. So I'll start with you, Juliana, and then we'll move to our next presenter. Please, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, David. I hope you can hear me well. Um, I am very honored to be part of this panel today, really among um, great and distinguished panelists. So thank you very much for the invitation. Um, so I would like to focus my brief intervention on the issue of sustainable urbanization and climate change more broadly but with an emphasis on um, in lower income context. And I'll try to do, what I'll try to do is draw a few insights from the development economics literature as an economist that I am, but also primarily from um, our experience at the International Growth Center, working with local governments um, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia primarily. Um, so, you know, thinking of SDG 11, um, there are many challenges. I guess that inhibit further progress towards the goal um, and which are very specific to lower income context, you know, just to name a few, rapid population growth, rapid urbanization, they are very distinguished impacts from climate change, we can think of forced displacement, um, political and economic instability, et cetera. Um, but I think the main argument that I'd like to make um, today, again, based on our exper experience working with local government in this context, is that it is very hard to embed sustainability objectives and really pursue these objectives in a proactive rather than reactive way, unless we can truly demonstrate that these sustainability objectives are very much aligned um, with you know, national government broader agendas on economic development. Um, so you know, all of us working in the urban space, we know that cities should be in the front line of climate action. So I think the question really is how can you know we make sure that they are frontline, right? And I think in the case of um, poor developing cities, um, which tend to contribute very marginally to the emission of greenhouse gases, um, what I argue is that you know development and adaptation slash resilience um, goals should be pursued in tandem, and you know these in turn can also aid mitigation efforts, which by no means should be sidelined, which are very important as well. So let me try to give you a few examples to illustrate um, this point. Um, we know that cities from a pure you know, productivity slash economic development perspective, at their best, they are engines of national economic growth. They provide the clearest path from poverty to prosperity. And as we know, the mechanism really is when clustered together in other centers, firms and workers are able to unlock what we call the miracle of productivity which is really essential to raise incomes and living standards. And the crucial ingredient to unlocking this miracle of productivity is good connectivity. So we can think of denser environments, good public transport links, et cetera. Now, from a livability and sustainability perspective, I think it is very, very important to shift the predominant narrative, which is from pursuing development and adaptation objectives in cities 
to through cities. And I think this is especially the case um, for lower income context. So, you know, providing basic uh, urban infrastructure and services can really help um, cushion against climate shock. So we can think of public goods um, such as water and sanitation, waste management, roads, etc. So these are you know, truly needed to build livable and productive cities, but they can also support um, building more sustainable and um, climate resilient cities. So in other words, you know, getting the city basics right can already aid a lot of progress. And you know, these objectives are pretty much in every local government um, agenda. Let me give you a second example. Um, so we can think of, uh, for instance, investing um, in technologies and practices which are relevant to say um, wastewater control and treatment. You know, by doing so, cities are not only helping to reduce uncontrolled greenhouse gas emissions, but they're also improving um, public health. And at the same time, they're able to create jobs, which is very, very important and a discussion that is often sidelined. So, you know, these can um, help creating jobs both at the high and low skilled ends of the spectrum. So high, we can think of, you know, research related jobs and perhaps at the lower skill end, we can think of, you know, more um, labor intensive jobs in construction and so forth. And so, you know, all these objectives really can help the population become more resilient to um, natural disasters. Now, a final example, um, which I really like is, you know, this idea of, building the green cities of tomorrow, which again, not only aids on livability and sustainability objectives, but can also once more provide opportunities um, to absorb the really large pool of low skilled labor and you know, in turn help tackling youth unemployment. So I think it's important to recognize that low skilled workforce will continue to drive a large proportion of the economic activity um, that takes place in developing cities and so I think there is um, merit in working to facilitate more and better jobs for these populations. So it's really about these small policy changes and investments which can help, you know, doing current things more sustainably. We can think of, you know, sustainable building and construction, again, waste management provision and, and so forth. So um, the final point that I'd like to make is that I think you know, when it comes to pursuing development and adaptation goals in tandem, a key area of attention should really be on raising incomes of the urban poor. And I think that is truly the meaning of, you know, inclusive growth that we speak about. So again, just to illustrate my point, when a city is hit by a natural disaster, you know, we can think of floods, landslides, it is really low income households that are more exposed, not only because they are more likely to live in risk prone areas, but also, you know, due to the inferior quality of informal housing material, and also the fact that, you know, these groups, they are less able to cope and recover um, because of financial constraints, you know, limited savings, um, really limited access to finance and insurance um, and safety nets in general. So, you know, raising incomes of the urban poor, I think is arguably the most important adaptation strategy. And again, you know, every local government has this or should have this in their agendas. And, and you know, trying to pursue these objectives in tandem, I think is really um, the way forward. Um, thank you very much. Great, great start. Thank you very much, Juliana. That was fantastic. Um, I think uh, Gemma, sorry, uh, Zina will have much more to say about uh, raising incomes of the urban poor as a critical element of, uh, sustainable cities. Um, uh, also, we have now um, Maruja Kardama. Uh, David, uh, the, the um, assistant uh, uh, okay. general is, is with us. So I think it would be now best to introduce him and uh, sure, sure, sure. ask him to activate his, mon his uh, microphone and uh, video. Okay, fine. Thank you, Charles. Um, so we have now... Um, our uh, guest speaker, <coughs> excuse me, His Excellency Mikhail Mlinar, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the United Nations Human Settlements Program, uh, who is uh, on short notice taking the place of uh, the Executive Director who had a family emergency and had to go back to her home country. Um, His Excellency was previously Slovakia's permanent representative to the United Nations. Um, 
where he served as vice president of the UNICEF executive board, vice chair of the peace building commission. Sorry. <laughs> um, three-time chair of the ad hoc working group on the revitalization of the work of the General Assembly and vice president of the Assembly of State Parties to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. In 2021-2022, he was a member of the Advisory Committee on Sustainable Urbanization to the president of the General Assembly. So without further ado, please, uh, Your Excellency um, Mikhail Mlinar, you have the floor. Thank you very much uh, and sincere greetings uh, to you all. Thanks to the organizers for this important initiative. Apologies indeed on behalf of our executive director, Madam Maimuna Mokhsharif, uh, who had a family emergency and she had to travel to Malaysia on short notice. And uh, our agenda is quite packed. Uh, I had to step out uh, for a few minutes from uh, another meeting, but uh, I really would like to say that we are happy to uh, join you for this uh, webinar organized by the Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future and present to you briefly Yuan Habitat's perspective on uh, linkages between SDG 11 and um, uh, of course our work on sustainable cities uh, uh, as well as uh, SDG 12 on uh, sustainable consumption and uh, production and what strategies might we adopt to achieve these uh, global goals. Uh, perhaps the first and uh, the most obvious point to make uh, is to appreciate that the SDGs were formulated by the global community to address uh, the multiple and interlinked uh, challenges it faces from the climate crisis, uh, conflict uh, and massive displacement to environmental degradation, uh, persistent poverty, inequality, hunger, and threats to uh, public health. Uh, each of the 17 SDGs uh, that uh, we adopted back in 2015 are therefore interlinked and progress on each supports progress on another. And uh, on other occasions, I have repeatedly referred to SDG 11 probably as the most uh, cross-cutting SDG that um, we have um, in the whole list of 17, precisely because um, uh, we believe that uh, sustainable uh, urban development uh, is a key enabler for many of the other uh, SDGs and for progress in, uh, in them, because uh, uh, through SDG 11, we can uh, improve, uh, to say the least, access to education, access to clean water or sanitation, uh, to health uh, services, uh, and uh, I can go on in, in the same vein. With the rapid urbanization, the linkage between SDG 11, which aims uh, at making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, uh, and sustainable, is becoming even stronger with SDG 12 uh, on, of ensuring sustainable consumption and production patterns. Consider the following facts which uh, illustrate the urbanization and consumption and production nexus. Uh, just uh, to give you uh, some practical examples. Uh, for example, 56% of the global population or about 4.4 uh, billion people currently live in urban areas. And by 2050, the urban population will more than double in size. And in fact, 70% of the global population will be city dwellers. So uh, if uh, anybody needs a wake up call or uh, an alarm clock uh, that, uh, that would start uh, ringing, uh, I think uh, uh, the, the facts are, are clear enough. Uh, Cities account for more than 75% of a country's GDP, consuming 75% of global primary energy, and they emit uh, between 50 and 60% of the world's uh, total greenhouse gases. The pace of waste generation will outpace population growth by more than double by 2050. And of course, we need to urgently address the, uh, uh, the waste uh, 
situation in many of our global regions and centers. Uh, total municipal waste generated in the world will increase from uh, 2.01 billion tons annually in 2016 to about 3.4 billion tons by 2050 with a positive correlation between income growth and waste generation. So the task uh, is obvious. Given the concentration of people and the intensity of resource consumption, urbanization can sometimes be perceived as a negative phenomenon that is detrimental for people and the planet. And in fact, uh, since my arrival uh, here in Nairobi uh, at UN Habitat uh, uh, almost uh, three weeks ago, I've had a, uh, quite a number of um, interesting, uh, for that matter, conversations uh, in, in that same context, uh, you know, to what extent urbanization is a positive uh, phenomenon and to what extent it may generate uh, further challenges. Uh, so, um, and I think the, uh, uh, the answer clearly is that uh, we need to uh, address uh, urbanization in its entirety in a, in a comprehensive manner and we need to capitalize on the positive drivers of uh, urbanization, while at the same time, of course, we need to address uh, some of the negative uh, aspects. Uh, and indeed, uh, unplanned urbanization can have enormous negative consequences. However, we must also recognize the power and the benefit uh, of the city stems uh, from the proximity between people, the density of the city and the efficiency in resource consumption that results uh, from a city's compactness. For example, in well-planned and compact cities, which follow mixed land use patterns, people need to travel only short distances, saving fuel and time, and of course, having a positive effect on other elements uh, that we focused on. This reduced uh, the pressure on land, and water bodies uh, that eases the sustainable management uh, and use of natural resources, contributing to target 12.2 uh, of SDG 12 uh, specifically. Compact cities also reduce losses of water and energy in pipelines and transmission networks. Reduced uh, distances also ease waste uh, collection efforts, uh, often the single largest element of a municipality's budget. Planning for sustainable urbanization also means planning in advance of migration and growth and providing for planned city extensions that efficiently connect cities to the hinterland. Such planning practices reduce uh, wastage in food and energy associated uh, with the transportation of materials and people. The new urban agenda, our key blueprint that uh, was adopted in 2016, recognizes the synergy between sustainable urbanization and sustainable consumption and production. And UN Habitat, through its programs and technical assistance uh, projects, supports member states in their efforts to implement the new urban agenda uh, in uh, in the specific uh, SDG areas and targets. Uh, and um, just uh, let me quote uh, a few quick examples. Uh, on World Habitat Day in 2018, together with the president of Kenya, we launched the so-called Waste Wise Cities program. The program uh, has now expanded to a network of over 400 cities where cities exchange experience and knowledge on waste management technologies and practices. UN Habitat supports the initiative by providing continuous capacity building support and updated tools for better waste management. A waste management uh, and assessment tool developed by UN Habitat is now used by many cities in undertaking a participatory assessment of waste management uh, practices involving citizens, businesses, the city administration and waste workers leading to greater reuse and recycling of materials and reducing the burden on the existing and already overstressed or overstretched uh, landfills and uh, dump sites. 
for several years, in fact, UN Habitat has been working with member states in uh, updating their building standards and codes with the aim of reducing energy consumption associated with the construction and operation of buildings. UN Habitat is working with industry leaders to identify ways ways to update the uh, LEED certif certification to lower emissions of carbon and methane in particular. In several cities, UN Habitat uh, promotes sustainable mobility with a focus on better facilities for walking and cycling uh, integrated with good public transport. Among other things, this potentially enables countries to divert uh, wasteful fossil fuel subsidies to public transport, contributing to target 12.8. In the same context, it also prom promotes a transition to electric mobility. We also work with governments and cities in supporting the development of national urban policies to accelerate the implementation of the new urban agenda to achieve SDG 11 and SDG 12 and other urban related SDGs, and together with United Cities local government, uh, the UCLG, UN Habitat promotes uh, voluntary local reviews to accelerate the process of localizing the SDGs, which we believe is a key enabler, a key catalyst of uh, better implementing uh, the uh, SDGs and the 2030 agenda uh, as such. Dear colleagues, uh, we firmly believe that uh, achieving the SDGs requires not only effective coordination between various arms of government and between different spheres of government from national to provincial and local, but also the participation of uh, important local actors, including women, community organizations, youth, businesses, and uh, educational institutions. And it is only through this comprehensive and whole of society approach that we can make progress towards the SDGs. And we are actually applying the same approach uh, within the UN system. Uh, we are doing everything possible to uh, work uh, very closely together within the UN system in the uh, whole of uh, system and UN as one approach. To Thanks very much, that. Your Excellency. We, we have to move on. Daunting challenges. I would like to and uh, on a positive, on an optimistic note, because uh, um, being an eternal optimist, um, uh, I think uh, this is uh, uh, an important uh, uh, context that we need to keep in our efforts. Uh, just recently, on the 30th of March, uh, we observed the first International Day of Zero Waste, and on the same day, witnessed the first high-level meeting of the General Assembly on zero waste, where our executive director, Madame um, uh, Maimouna Mokhsharif, also participated. Uh, through a uh, resolution adopted uh, uh, by the uh, United Nations Environment Assembly in March 2022, progress has been made towards developing a legally binding instrument to end the menace of plastic pollution. That's uh, another important aspect. Thanks to the work of researchers and scientists, there is a much better understanding of the impact uh, our patterns of consumption and production have on natural ecosystems. From UN Habitat, we can assure you that we will continue working uh, very hard and very closely with cities, social movements, private industry, national governments and partners within the UN system in integrating SDG 11, and SDG 12 to achieve the global goals. And let me end with an invitation to the uh, upcoming uh, high-level political forum, which uh, will be hosted um, in the middle of July in New York, uh, where SDG 11 is one of those which uh, will be reviewed and where UN Habitat, together with other UN agencies, but with uh, many member states that will be presenting their uh, uh, their uh, national, uh, voluntary national reports, uh, uh, where we will have another opportunity to uh, focus on, on the same issues. Thank you very much for this initiative uh, and uh, back to you.
Deputy Director, thank you so very much uh, for your comments and also for reminding us that the HLPF this year will be focusing on these very subjects. Uh, so thank you again for joining us. David, uh, now back to you uh, to introduce our next speaker and we'll move on with our panel. Okay, thank you. Um, our next speaker will be Maruja Kadama, Secretary General of the Partnership on Sustainable Low Carbon Transport, SLOCAT, who specializes in integrated urban and territorial development. Um, over the past 18 years, she has worked with multi multilateral institutions, national and subnational governments, NGOs, and philanthropies in more than 30 countries across continents to develop public policies, capacity projects, and multi-stakeholder partnerships. In the interest of keeping her CV short, it could go on for a long time. Let me just come to the last bit um, to show her on the ground experience from 2004 to 2010. She was deputy director of the representation of the Southwest of England to the U European Union, where she led on the sustainability portfolio for a partnership of regional authorities, academia, and the private sector. So without further ado, uh, please, the floor is yours, Maruja. Thanks. Thanks very much, David, and thanks for having me here. It's an absolute delight to be here reconnecting with colleagues that I admire profoundly and, and meeting new ones. So as I was preparing uh, the thoughts that I wanted to share with you today, three premises came to mind. The first one is the uniqueness uh, of the SDG 11 to me, is that it's a place-based goal. It's about placemaking. It's about community building. So based on this, my second premise is that the implementation of SDG 11 should be about improving and transforming in a mutually reinforcing manner the systems that configure cities. I am here today wearing a transport hat. So my third premise is that the transformation of transport and mobility in cities is inextricably linked to the improvement of other uh, systems in, in cities. So I would like to take you now uh, uh, through a bit of a, a set of reflections on target 11.2. Let's review together the state of affairs of that target. Let's remember that it's the target about providing access to transport systems for all, improving road safety and notably by expanding public transport. The official indicator to measure progress is the proportion of population that has convenient access to public transport. Data for 2020 from over 1,500 cities around the world is indicating that on average, only about 30% of their urban areas are served by convenient public transport. Given the variations in, in populations, uh, concentrations in these cities, this translates into only about 52% of the world population having convenient access to public transport. But the regional variations are really wide. For instance, in Africa, only 31% of urban population has convenient access to public transport, whether formal or informal transport. If we connect target 11.2 with target 9.1 about developing infrastructure to support economic development and human being, the official indicator in this area is the proportion of rural population who live within two kilometers of an all season road. For instance, in Asia, 560 million people are lacking proper rural access. If we focus on the road safety aspect of target 11.2 and connect it to target 3.6 about uh, reducing deaths from road uh, traffic accidents, the latest figures indicate that road transport is responsible for 1,350,000 deaths annually. This makes road accidents the third biggest cause of death for the economically active population globally, only behind cancer and cardiovascular disease. That is huge. So the lack of progress on 11.2 uh, is not good news, but it's not good news either for other SDG targets relating to poverty and inequality, air pollution, women's and girls' empowerment, decent economic growth, or climate change. Without progress on convenient access to public transport, we are not enabling progress on access to public services and to social and economic and political inclusion, because basically access to transport is access to jobs and to socioeconomic opportunities. We are not decoupling economic growth for environmental degradation. Uh, let me share with you that, for instance, countries across Asia have recorded uh, quite impressive high motorization growth uh, with increases in more than 200% over the past decades in some countries. And we are not achieving either high productivity due to the loss of productivity in congested cities. And we are not reducing the adverse environmental impact of cities or, or on air quality either. The World Health Organization is telling us that 99% of the world's urban population is breathing polluted air. So what is standing in the way of advancing on this target 11.2 to provide transport systems, improving road safety, notably by expanding public transport? A series of interconnected challenges that also spread across different SDGs. But today I would like to focus on four of them. 
The first one is the limited uh, capabilities in governments and professionals for integrated transport and land planning in cities. The second one is the, pre the prevalence of fossil fuel subsidies. The third one is the limited uh, capacity for economic valuation by decision makers of public transport and active mobility. And the fourth is the difficult conversations about changing lifestyles across geographies. These interconnected challenges are hindering progress on 11.2, as I said, but also on the targets of the SDG 11 on participatory in, uh, integrated planning or environmental impact or green and public spaces, but they are also hindering the mutually reinforcing implementation between access to transport systems and several of the targets across other SDGs. If we briefly examine each of these targets and also throw some positive light, you know, what is what are some improvements that we are seeing and what are some ways forward? Let's just start with the first one. So this notion about limited capabilities, uh, capabilities in governments for integrated uh, land and public, uh, um, uh, sorry, land and transport planning. The issues here are, are, are rather simple. For instance, the German uh, corporation ran a study putting figures into the huge shortage of transport planners in developing countries. And we also know that land and transport planning department in cities are not always talking to each other. There's positive signs. We are seeing an increased number of cities adopting what we call sustainable urban mobility plans, which are integrated shared visions uh, and the multi-stakeholder governance approaches for the mobility in a city. In recent years, we have seen not only European cities adopting them as in the past, but also Latin American cities massively adopting them. And in the past year, more Asian cities have turned to these sustainable urban mobility plans to deal with their congestion. For instance, in 2021, Foshan became China's first city to, to adopt a, what we call a SAMP, sustainable urban mobility plan, and Medam in Indonesia adopted its first SAMP in 2022. We're also seeing a positive science in proximity-based state planning for transport. The concept of the 15-minute city has taken a lot of traction in transport, seeing cycling lanes and temporary uh, uh, pedestrianization took place around the world in cities during the pandemic. So what we are needing is more capacity building programs for integrated land and transport planning in the cities. We need to support governments to be capable of adopting more SUMPs and more NUMPs and integrating these with the national urban plans uh, for economic development, for health, and for climate strategies. We also need uh, these plans to be based on what we call the Avoid, Shift, and Improve framework, which is very much about uh, taking approaches that, while guaranteeing access to transport and mobility, are avoiding unnecessary motorized trips. They are shifting to less carbon-intense modes, and they are improving vehicle design, energy efficiency, and clean energy sources for different types of vehicles. So. Um, more attention to the application of the 15-minute city in Global South cities, I think it's also very important because, of course, we know that Global South cities are characterized by a sprawling and informal urban development, and we don't want this 15-minute city notion for transport planning to become uh, a potential source of segregation in, uh, in urban populations. The second challenge is very much about this prevalence of fossil fuel subsidies. The issues here are very clear. Again, transport sector remains 97% powered by fossil fuels. This connects us to target uh, 72, for instance, on the increase in renewable energies. And, and fossil fuel subsidies are standing in the way of investing in sustainable transport choices in cities for all citizens, which links, of course, to uh, target point uh, target 12.2 on, on rationalizing the inefficient uh, use of fossil uh, subsidies. We are seeing some positive signs. The pressures for energy supply are reinvigorating discussions about energy efficiency and energy independence, including in transport. And we have seen in recent years a huge number of national and subnational jurisdictions setting time bound targets to phase out internal combustion engines. This is not automatically leading to renewables based transport electrification, though. So, what we are needing is phasing out fossil fuel subsidies. We need renewable blending mandates coupled with these transport electrification targets, and we need more attention to the risk of a potential divide between global north and global south cities uh, around electrification. The third challenge is that that notion of limited economic valuation by decision makers of public transport and active mobility issues. Public transport is still nowadays the most cost efficient way of giving people access to jobs while decarbonizing daily lives, and walking and cycling are essential feeders to public transport. Uh, walking is the principal mode of transport in the Global South, accounting for 70% of all trips in, in, in many African cities. Still, investment in safe walking and cycling infrastructure is rather limited, and public transport is not regarded as a common good deserving special attention. And we know that 
local governments and transport uh, authorities are struggling to keep many transport systems afloat after the pandemic. We see some positive signs, free rides or reduced tickets installed in Germany or in Luxembourg, a significant increase in the number of countries developing active mobility strategies. And for instance, WHO coming up with a health economic assessment tool, KIT, which is actually enabling policymakers at the local, regional and national levels to estimate the economic value of the health benefits of increased cycling and walking. So we need a bit more than of that. Imagine how far we could get if we actually shifted all the money that goes into fossil fuel subsidies in transport into sustainable modes of transport in cities. Um, we all we really need as well to harness the momentum that we saw around the pandemic in these pop up infrastructures for active mobility and, and take them into permanent uh, uh, approaches and structures. The challenge for, and this is the last day observation I wanted to share with you, is of course the challenge on the difficult but very needed conversation about changing lifestyles. This connects us to target uh, 12.8. Uh, we know that the issue here is that over the 20th century, the car industry and car centric urban planning has been selling as not only a product, but also a lifestyle and a notion of freedom, even if it's to sit in your car and a personal right to drive a car, even if that clashes with the personal right of other users of public space. So what do we need here is to facilitate this conversation across geographies, a conversation about less car dependent lifestyles and democratic use of the shared use of public space. And I think we also need to pay a bit of attention to the e-cars mania, because we know that when something is guilt free, we tend to consume much more of it. That's human behavior. And we don't want more traffic jams in cities, even if these are electric cars. And we don't want to perpetuate the segregation in cities between those who can access a car, even if it's an electric car, and those who cannot access a car. So in conclusion, if the implementation of Target 11.2 uh, and the uh, improvement of access to transport uh, and mobility in cities does not work for population groups in the most vulnerable situations, then our cities will not work. And that would be the thought I would like to leave you with. So back to you, David. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you so very much, David. Uh, over to you. Just before that, though, I would like to remind our panelists, uh, you, you know, acknowledging that we've invited you and uh, are very keen to hear what you have to say. We will ask you to try to stick to approximately seven minutes of presentation. You recognize, of course, that we allowed the Assistant Secretary General to run over. Uh, we did that out of respect for his position and his very busy schedule. But in order for us to hear all of you and have a meaningful contribution from each of you, I ask that you do please try to stick to the approximately seven minute uh, intervention. Thank you. David, over to you. Thank you. Charles, and thank you, Marusha, for that very interesting presentation. It's a really good idea to get a window into this uh, agenda through one of the targets having to do with road safety. It's an ec excellent way of approaching it. Uh, we'll come back to this in the Q&A. Uh, now we have Fernando Ortiz Moya, who is currently a policy researcher at the Institute for Global Environmental Strategies in Japan. He's an urbanist exploring how cities adapt and respond to socioeconomic and environmental problems. He focuses on urban policies to accelerate sustainable development transitions. And two areas of recent research include cities' localization of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development uh, and urban-based solutions to confront climate change. He has a doctorate in architecture uh, from the University of Tokyo, plus a number of other degrees, but he's essentially an architect turned pub urban planner and policy wonk. So, Fernando, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are, uh, distinguished colleagues. It's uh, Thank you so much for the invitation to be here today. It's really my great pleasure to be able to speak here about SDG 11. Uh, sustainable cities and communities, and also to share in some insights from my research. So we, we all know that the world, it's something that is being repeated everywhere. The world keeps urbanizing. Uh, more than half of the population is living now in cities. Uh, we are expecting that at least two thirds of the world population will be living in cities in the future. So it was great that the 2030 agenda recognized the important role of cities by having one single SDG, SDG 11, uh, talking about uh, cities in particular, sustainable cities and communities. But nevertheless, it is important to remember that cities are key agents 
in delivering most of the targets comprised by all 17 SDGs. So we all know cities are at the forefront of fighting climate change, uh, also on putting forward uh, circular the circular economy, uh, creating sustainable modes of transport, helping to uh, create more equal societies to bridge the gender gap. So cities has been really key to implement the 2030 agenda holistically. What we were talking at the introduction to you about all these interlinkages, many of those interlinkages are happening at the local level, are, are happening in cities. But nevertheless, this is a very difficult task. Uh, to The 2030 agenda creates this very complex uh, framework with 17 goals, 169 targets, indicators to measure progress. So for many local governments, especially if they are a small size or they have, might not have enough funding resources, it's difficult to articulate this into concrete solutions and to bring plans to fruition. And this is why there's been a, a new policy tool that is one of the things I've been focusing uh, on, my, on my work that is called voluntary local reviews. So voluntary local reviews um, are the local response to the review and follow-up process established by the 2030 agenda in which cities uh, undertake a voluntary review of progress uh, on the SDGs, not only SDG 11, but looking at large on all different SDGs. So the first VLRs were presented at the high level political forum for sustainable development in New York in 2018. And ever since, more than 150 local and regional governments have conducted, conducted a VLR, some of them even more than once. So against this backdrop, it's always worth asking then, why are cities embracing in greater number of the VLRs as part of the sustainable development strategies? So in my work, I have enjoyed seeing how VLRs have evolved. I've talked to local governments uh, from all over the world. And I've been looking and analyzing how the VLRs is really helping to, to advance a local, uh, the SDGs at the local level. So something that I've been seeing is like the VLRs has evolved for being a tool to report progress towards the SDGs uh, to serve larger purposes as within local administration. And especially across two aspects that I want to, to really emphasize today. So first, VLRs are really helping local governments to strive for greater policy integration and for bridging the gap between the global goals and the and the local and the local challenges. So something that is very key of the of the SDGs, those interlinkages that we were talking about at the beginning, that all this interconnection between all the different goals. And to do so, that goes against a typical uh, setting of many local governments in which we have all these silos, all these different departments in which they are not always talking to each other. So it is the, it is the part of the VLR when you really have to create these conversations, not only within the city government, but also with uh, different stakeholders. So this was the case of the small town of Shimokawa here in Japan, in Hokkaido, in one of the uh, farther north, north uh, regions, uh, island of Japan, in which this is a small town with around 3,000 people, very far away from everywhere, um, took into the challenge to integrate the SDGs into its policies and to translate the SDGs to the local level. And through a very extensive stakeholder engagement process, uh, consisting of 13 workshops, as well as surveys, the town reformulated this, its policies and created the what they call the Shimokawa Vision 2030, in which the town is embracing the SDGs and it's transforming it to its own Shimokawa goals, uh, bringing the local reality to the localization of the SDGs. So the town recognizes that, again, they their action goes beyond SDG 11, and they try to bring all the SDGs together and to create a vision for the town of what they want to be by 2030. Also, the other aspect I wanted to briefly talk upon today is on the follow-up and review process. We all know that it's very important to have a plan, it's very important to implement the plans, but at the same time, we need to evaluate how we are following up on that plan. So we need to evaluate, are we going on the right direction or are things not going as planned? 
So that's why the 2030 agenda created this, encouraged this uh, follow-up and review frameworks that are usually limited to national levels of government. But cities are also taking into this challenge. And what is more important, there are some cases in which cities are beginning to align the follow-up and review process of the SDGs with uh, policy cycles. So for example, Helsinki in Finland, uh, the city has conducted already two VLRs. So the first one happened in 2019, and it happened at the midpoint of its municipal strategy, which was from 2017 to 2021. So the VLR helped to evaluate how was the city doing, what was the achievements, what were the shortcomings, and what can be improved for the next two remaining years of the, um, of the strategy. But then in 2021, the city create, uh, published its second VLR, in which they were already looking at the complete period of the strategy, of the 2017-2021 strategy, and then help to prepare the city for its next strategy, the 2021 to 2025. So overall, the VLR really helped to wrap up one period of the municipal um, of the municipality and, and to really move forward. So Overall, we can see how the VR has really positioned themselves as an amazing tool to accelerate the localization of the SDGs. And I'm happy to then answer any questions that we may have later on in the discussion. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Great, thank you very much, Fernanda. That was very interesting. The VLRs, <laughs> we'll come back to that uh, and their role in um, evaluating plans and progress um, at the local level. Okay, so now we're moving on towards SDG 12, although Zinat Niazi, our next speaker, sort of bridges the two goals since she's also worked very much on sustainable urban development. She's Senior Vice President and knowledge, Chief Knowledge Officer at Development Alternatives Group India, where she has spent much of her career. Her work over three decades is focused on sustainable housing and habitat in human settlements, community-based approaches to climate and disaster resilience, and support to national, subnational, and local governments in mainstreaming integrated planning for achieving Agenda 2030 and the Paris Agreement. Um, so she's also currently working on sustainable consumption and production systems through resource efficiency, circular economy, and addressing equity concerns in resource access. So without further ado, you have the floor, Zina. Thank you. Thank you, David. And thanks to the Stakeholder Forum to give me this opportunity to share uh, some thoughts on the, uh, I'd say, coupled SDG 11 and 12 uh, sort of agendas within the larger 2030 agenda. Uh, it is, um, it is of course, um, uh, you know, very interesting when we look at these two together. And I think uh, colleagues before me, uh, panelists before me have spoken of SDG 11 as being really the the, the spatial goal, the goal where everything sort of uh, comes to play. It's the it's it's a place place making goal in that sense, and I agree totally. Uh, but I and and uh, you know to 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 start talking about sustainable production and consumption uh, goal number twelve in relation to goal eleven. We and I'm going to focus my thoughts mainly on the global south, uh, primarily because as we go forward in this century of urbanization we uh, we will we see that the largest uh, growth in urban uh, in, in in urbanization and the uh, the fastest urbanization is happening in the global south primarily it, it's asia and africa we also know from the data now that the two countries within asia and africa who are going to be contributing the most and the fastest are nigeria in africa and uh, india in in, um, in in Asia. And so, you know, the conditions here uh, are something that we need to understand before we understand and the nature of urbanization as, as we deal with uh, the um, SCP issues in, in these countries. And, you know, if I look at if I look at the conditions in South Asia and India uh, specifically, we see that a lot of our urbanization is not just growing the growth of the large cities. It's, it's a lot of it is rural transformation and it's the growth in the numbers of the small and medium towns and cities. This is important to understand because the models of production uh, that would that would favor uh, such uh, such a such a nature of urban growth are very different from the models of production consumption that we see in other parts of the world. 
the second thing that we need to uh, understand here is that we are talking about a huge amount of urban infrastructure being constructed in the uh, as we go forward but we also see that there is a simultaneous creation of greenfield cities as there is a transformation of the brownfield city cities so again the management has to respond to these uh, conditions thus um, you know sdg 12 in fact was and I'm sure Fabian will speak a little bit more about it, uh, was the one goal that had a very interesting instrument, the 10-year favor program, uh, to, to help it kick forward. Yeah, But eight years from now, and a lot of work has happened in that goal, there has been uh, th there have been areas which I think we need to we need to sit back and, and uh, sort of consider. Uh, at the beginning of our conversation today, we spoke about Gandhi, and I want to take another quote uh, from Gandhi, which is not so popularly known, but it's a conversation between Gandhi and his grandson, um, which was quoted by his grandson. And it, it, it talks about uh, nonviolence and nonviolence against nature being that of wastage and overconsumption, and non or rather I'd say violence against nature is overconsumption, and violence against society being, uh, sorry, violence against nature being waste and violence against uh, society being overconsumption. So you are looking at uh, at the um, perspective of waste and overconsumption, both the SCP issues from a from a from a very philosophical uh, nonviolence um, uh, paradigm. It, and when we when we start looking at it from that perspective, uh, let's look at sustainable consumption and sustainable production in intricately linked. But how do they how do they pan out? Uh, the question that I would like to ask from the consumption perspective is who is consuming what and why? And I think we have to start answering these. Even as we look at the north and south divide of overconsumption, low consumption, we look at the half divide between those who have and those who don't have. And as they grow economic, economically, the consumption patterns change and they become more, uh, you know, societies become more um, climate emitting in that sense and, in, uh, and resource intensive. But what are the conditions that are uh, that change people's behaviors to to, re to reduce or to make them uh, consume more sustainably? There are three factors that we need to look at, uh, which come from the social practice theory. One is what we call material or infrastructure. The second is knowledge and skills. And the third is attitudes and value systems. And each one of these need to be acted upon for societies to uh, change their behaviors towards more greener consumption. In societies like India, where we are going to be growing so fast, we are growing so fast, we are consuming, we are, uh, you know, in, increasing our building stock, which is uh, the largest uh, emitter of CO2, um, um, you know, amongst the sectors after the power sector. Uh, how do we choose what to build? Uh, how do we choose the kind of homes and the kind of materials that we need to take forward? And I'll give you my own example. I was I was uh, tracking myself on the uh, global on the footprint um, um, uh, app, and I realized that my carbon footprint is really high, despite the fact that I am I'm uh, I'm a, I'm a low a low scale consumer, primarily because of the materials with which my building the house that I live in are made. Now, how do how can I choose to change those materials or to choose to build with something which is very different? It means that I need to have access to those materials. So that connects the sustainable consumption to the sustainable production space. Who's producing those materials? Are those materials available? Are they accessible? Can I buy them? I'm, are they affordable to me? Are those are the skills to change? to uh, to con construct houses in low resource and low energy embodied energy materials available and in in all of this space you know there is a there is a whole arena of market development there is a whole arena of technology development there is a whole arena of financing of producers that is required and we uh, which is where countries like you know, whether it's India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, South Africa, any name the countries, we all require to move forward in 
technology development in new revenue models for for production systems we require um, financing for those enterprises that will produce greener materials we require skills uh, that would uh, you know con convert those materials into homes and infrastructure so there there is here is where a very strong connection between what a city produces and what a city consumes uh, is, is is connected the second space really is um, when, when we talk about the state's responsibility, so there's an individual behavior which is dependent on these conditions, but then there's a state's responsibility in, in pushing forward or creating the market and creating the conditions for sustainable condition, sustainable consumption. And I think one of the more, uh, one of the places where a lot of movement has, we've seen in terms of concepts, but not really in terms of conversion or transformation is in public procurement. And public procurement is one arena, sustainable public procurement, especially in the buildings and infrastructure space. Uh, of course, we uh, other materials, uh, other, other sectors, but building infrastructure space where we really need uh, countries to, to step up and that requires a whole lot of um, you know work um, up till up till the time when can where state governments uh, can national governments can start you know uh, promote uh, looking at public procurement or sustainable public procurement of building materials or uh, other products and services for uh, within cities and that which means you know you're looking at uh, value chain analysis you need capacities for uh, you know life cycle analysis you require um, transparency and you require traceability of where those materials are within the building and construction arena. This is a uh, this is an informal sector largely in in the global south, and so it's it's a big challenge, especially in the traceability of uh, of looking at materials and technologies that are more sustainable and and are responsible. So that's the second. That's 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 the other point that I want to make. The third um, uh, sort of point that I wanted to uh, look at was um, uh, with respect to, um, uh, you know, uh, I mentioned who produces, uh, you know, just as we said, who consumes what and why, there's also who produces what and how. And and there, we when we look at who produces, this is the other uh, question that, that um, uh, other aspect that comes to our mind, which is a condition which we need to look at from, from the sustainability perspective, especially in the global south is that the building sector um, and, and, and the infrastructure sector is a, is job creating. It, it has a huge potential for creating jobs and therefore production systems that can enhance job opportunities, green job opportunities are required to be promoted, to be developed. Uh, and that will also mean a lot of spread uh, of the wealth that is being created, local local spread of wealth that's being created. And so you spoke in the beginning about uh, urban, you know, uh, livelihoods or income for the urban poor. I think the production of infrastructure, the production of buildings, that's another space. The servicing of these is another space where uh, you, we need to see how those systems can include uh, local uh, populations so that there is local wealth uh, creation. And this has to become part of the sustainability uh, discussions in the production systems that we are talking about. Uh, I, 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 pardon me for interrupting, but I will kindly ask you to wrap up because you have gone. Quite yes, a I think I, I, I think I will. I think I will now. Just with uh, this last um, uh, point uh, in in half a half a minute, which basically says that if if you are able to, uh, if you're if if you're looking at uh, sustainable construction uh, consumption and production, then there are the you know I uh, there's a four point grid that we might want to look at what's happening locally and how is that responding globally? Uh, how are we responding to, to social needs and how are we responding to the ecological stress? And if it's in this, if we can fill this grid with the kind of uh, solutions, uh, then that's that's the way forward. It's a very simple uh, four point grid, which I, we've been working with uh, Kate Rawat on, uh, part of the Donut Economics um, uh, Action Lab. And I think it, it sort of gives you a basis on moving forward in using responsible materials, responsible infrastructure, and uh, responsible consumption at the same time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Zinat. And um, I think uh, we have a lot of uh, 
food for thought there. I need to move on quickly, though, because we now have uh, limited time. Uh, so our next speaker is Ramona, Ramona Liberoff, the executive director of the Platform for Accelerating the Circular Economy, PACE, which is hosted by the World Resources Institute. Ms. Liberoff has a background in the SDGs and impact investing, blended finance and innovation, and has been the CEO of something called the Spring Accelerator, which perhaps she'll mention, and COO of the Energy Innovation Hub. And she holds master's degrees from LSE and from Yale University. So please, Ramona, you have the floor. Thank you very much. And it's such a pleasure to be here with excellent colleagues and also such a, a global and varied audience um, to spend time with us. There are many common themes. We'll, we'll come back to things like collaboration and systems change. Um, in addition, things like the hidden um, negative effect of subsidies as I, I give my remarks. A little bit about PACE. We are a public, private and third sector partnership and we're created to accelerate the widespread adoption of the circular economy. Um, PACE started by researching and communicating the why of circular economy. There's a great case to make, make. If the circular economy were fully implemented, it would affect about 50% of our global resource use. But the question now really is how to implement a circular economy, because it looks very different um, depending on geographies and sectors. And also, crucially, who can drive a circular economy at scale? I would describe at the moment the relationship between SDG 12 and the circular economy borrowing Dickens rather than Gandhi. It's the best of times and the worst of times. It's the worst because we're deeply behind our targets. And ironically, this is partly due to the need for resources for the energy transition. But in a way, the best because we have some models, innovations and evidence of successful collaborations and how you actually lead toward a systems change. There's a lot of potential for circular economy to contribute, but we particularly need to widen our understanding of circular economy. Um, to give you a couple of good examples, to give some hope, um, uh, even of those in our leadership community, um, many of our companies uh, have been setting targets. For example, Philips have a circular revenue target for 25%. Um, Italian utility NL works with more than 700 innovative companies to lighten their material footprint. Um, in, in countries, um, industrial symbiosis in Denmark, in Catalan, um, the circular economy targets for Queensland and Australia, which manages to be both a biodiversity hotspot and a center for extractive industries, are all great examples of leadership. But we really want to see more of it. And we believe that we really have to think in the fullest extent of the circular economy in order to achieve that. Because circular economy right now, my fellow panelists may or may not agree, but we see it as being fairly marginal. Um, there's something called the circular, Circularity Gap Report put out every year that looks at the extent to which countries are circular to their relative to their potential. And really, even the best performer, the Netherlands, where I am at the moment, is only about 30% circular by this uh, measure. And most, even in Europe, are 10 to 12%. The rate isn't increasing. And we believe that's partly because most circular economy initiatives today focus on what we call the consequences of unsustainable consumption, mainly in the global north and mainly in areas like plastics recycling, um, fast fashion and textile waste and post-consumer food waste. These are incredibly important areas to tackle and things like wide scale recycling do need to be in place. However, we can't focus only on the consequences of overconsumption. We actually need to go deep into critical production systems, particularly if we're thinking about how to ensure a just transition for, for all. So for example, the two areas PACE will focus on in the, in the coming years are in the energy transition and in the food systems transition. On energy, uh, we have an interesting situation where if we were to put an infrastructure, really wide scale infrastructure, to collect the critical minerals that we need for the energy transition. This can be called urban mining, reverse logistics. There are various names for it. Um, but basically, we have a lot of what we already need out of the ground. Instead, many of our local regional policies have been a scramble to try and get sufficient uh, mining capacity and open new mines to try and get these materials from the ground and secure supply. We need to invest as much focus and as much energy in valuing what we already have that's already out of the ground than trying to get more. Um, and this is a key focus of our work. If we look at food systems, there's also um, the, the issue of food loss and waste in the production um, cycle, which doesn't get as much attention or focus as food loss and waste on the consumer side. 
but actually things like valuing what are called co-products or byproducts in production um, and putting some very simple technologies in place for better storage, uh, which are widely available, can really help us minimize food loss and waste and also valorize and create additional income streams from what is currently discarded. Um, it, obviously, these changes depend on where you are in the world, but as I say, there are many, many good examples of collaboration, technology, um, and initiatives that show us how we could actually scale this. But I'd, I'd make a final point to say that one of the overlooked elements in the circular economy transition is really the importance of leadership. We need very unusual leadership in our political systems, in our corporates, in order to try these things first, in order to go against the grain, to do things that may be more expensive, that may be more risky. Um, there are some good examples that exist that we both partner with and take inspiration from. For example, something called the First Movers Coalition, where um, in order to, to abate carbon in hard to abate sectors like steel and cement, which we still need, um, the idea was to bring together the purchasing power of many large companies in, with the pledge that then suppliers have security of demand and they can invest in technologies ahead of the curve. This both brings down the cost of those technologies and creates a, a virtuous cycle um, in decarbonization. And we believe that with the widespread adoption of circular economy strategies in food and energy, we can actually start to do the same. But we do need better knowledge in certain domains and more than anything, we need a certain kind of moral imagination that puts at the heart of all of this the need to only use what, what we can um, and to value what we have already, um, rather than necessarily securing future supply. Um, and the role of leadership in that is something that we feel very strongly about at PACE. And I look forward to hearing from the other panelists about their theories of um, wide-scale adoption for circular economy. Thank you very much. Ramona, uh, thank you so much. I'm going to jump in uh, to say that uh, I've spoken to all of our upcoming speakers. Uh, Fabian Pierre needs to leave uh, very soon, so I'm going to ask her to step in. And Fabian, maybe just briefly introduce yourself rather than us take time reading your bio. And this way we could all move on. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Charles, uh, for your understanding. Um, I hope everybody can hear me well. I'm Fabienne Pierre, I'm the coordinator of the 10-year framework of, of programs for sustainable consumption and production um, in uh, UNEP and it's One Planet Network Secretariat. Um, so I just wanted to start uh, with, a, with a, um, a, a figure from the International Resource Panel that estimates that over 50% of global GSG emissions and 90% of global biodiversity and water stress impacts are directly linked to the way we extract, cultivate, uh, and process material resources in our consumption and production systems. Um, and indeed, we know that, uh, unfortunately, only a small share uh, of the global economy is circular, as Ms. Liberov just, just mentioned. So science is clear. We know it also from the IPCC. We, we know it from IPVS that uh, there is an urgency to accelerate the structural transformation of the way we consume and produce. There is a need for this global inclusive uh, transition towards SCP as captured in, in SDG 12, including through circular economy. And it's an opportunity for all uh, to address the, the triple planetary crisis the, the world is facing, climate change, biodiversity loss and, and, and pollution, and to challenge that linear take, make, waste and grow now, clean up later models that uh, have thrived at the expense of our relationship with nature and community's well-being. So we, we also know, and this was uh, well highlighted um, by uh, my fellow pan panelists, that the way societies consume and produce uh, results in increasing inequalities and vulner vulnerabilities, which have been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic, with poverty and underconsumption remaining a pressing challenge in many countries, particularly in, developing, in the developing world. So this requires action on multiple fronts, uh, we said as well, with global stakeholders working together, a combination of adequate political, regulatory, financial frameworks, infrastructures, investments, social and economic transformations. Um, and that is the spirit of the 10-year framework of programs on SCP and its One Planet Network. As you may know, the, the 10 OFP, as we call it, uh, was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 2012, and it's a universal framework 
and a key implementation mechanism for SDG 12, of which it's uh, an integral an integral part, is the first target of, of SDG 12. It's also the framework of reference for decoupling economic growth from environmental degradation uh, under SDG 8. And the one plan network is that a very large multi-stakeholder network that implements the 10 OFP through global programs, initiatives, uh, by catalyzing cooperation, facilitating collaboration between government, civil society, and the private sector. We work in multiple areas and sectors, including what we call enabling policies and instruments, such as consumer information, public procurement, digitalization, circularity, lifestyles and education, and high impact sectors, uh, including food construction and tourism. Our network um, is, is very broad and is open. And so I wanna take that opportunity today to really call for all of you to join us. Uh, at the moment, we have uh, almost 6,000 organizational members um, in our network, and we really uh, look forward to, uh, to expanding that community so that we can um, continue supporting that global movement. So in 2021, uh, you may also be aware that the UN General Assembly decided to extend the mandate of the TEL OFP until 2030 to continue supporting and accelerating the implementation of SDG 12 and other SDG related targets across the 2030 agenda. And this decision reflected a high engagement from member states, but also high expectations. Um, it was really a call for an ambitious vision for multilateral and multi-stakeholder cooperation on SCP beyond 2022. And that translated into a new global strategy for SCP that will run from this year to 2030. That was developed under the leadership of uh, the TNOFP Intergovernmental Board through a broad consultative process. And I would like to invite all of you to go through this strategy and contribute. It's, it, this is not a 10 OFP strategy or UNEP strategy. It's really a strategy for the international community and for all of us to take action. It has four pillars. The first one is focused on positioning SCP as an essential requirement and, and delivery mechanism to achieve our global commitments for sustainable development but also for climate biodiversity and pollution. The second pillar is focused on enabling transformative changes through multi-stakeholder partnerships, tools, and solutions across high-impact systems and sectors. And here the objective is to help shift those societal choices towards sustainable lifestyles and consumption by leveraging enablers for change that I already mentioned, um, as well as demand-focused approaches um, in high-impact sectors. So we have lots of examples to share, but um, I don't have uh, time to go in the detail. Um, we, we are really happy to share more information, but just wanted to mention a few of them. Uh, we are at the moment, and there, there is a strong link with, uh, link with SDG 11, working on uh, a flagship initiative on transforming the construction sector through sustainable public procurement, for instance, so of course, working with governments, national, local governments, and the private sector, we have a, a, a global initiative uh, on tourism, the Global Tourism Plastic Initiative, that is engaging hundreds of companies, countries um, in uh, strong commitments for actions um, to reduce the use of plastic uh, in, that, uh, in that sector. We are also working on digitalization for circular economy or exploring the interface between circularity and consumption. Uh, and this was also mentioned um, in several interventions. So really looking at um, all those dimensions, but most importantly, how can change uh, changes in practice can be driven um, by, by demand and, and by um, yeah, triggering market, uh, market transformation in those high impact sectors. The third pillar. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Fabian. Um, hey, Fabian, thank you for uh, your comments. I know you're rushed off and we apologize for interrupting you. Uh, now, yeah. I, I'm going to do a bit of juggling because I've heard from uh, uh, Jan Anton, uh, Luca, and Gemma. Uh, Jan Anton has to leave at uh, 45 minutes uh, past the hour and Gemma at 50 minutes past the hour. But uh, Luca can stick with us a little bit longer. So without further uh, ado, um, Jan Anton, if you could pop in. Uh, kindly introduce yourself, and then we'll move on. Thank you. 
Thanks so much, Charles, and uh, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, and it's really a pleasure to be with you. Um, so my name is Jan-Lons Versanten. I'm working at Rubico currently. And Rubico is an international asset management firm headquartered in Rotterdam, the Netherlands. Um, at Rubico, I work on integrating the sustainable development goals into our different investment strategies. Um, and prior to joining um, Rubico, I've been working at the UN. I've been working as a consultant, and I've been writing my PhD on the role of companies in attaining the sustainable development goals. So what I wanted to do uh, with my remarks here is to focus exactly on that, the role of companies in achieving the SDGs. And I really believe that that's uh, deserving a lot of attention because I think without the active participation of companies, it's very unlikely that the SDGs will be achieved. I think this goes for the SDGs in general, but especially for SDG number 12 from responsible consumption and production, quite simply because companies are the well, key drivers of consumption and production patterns. Uh, we've already heard about the circular economy, so a key way in which uh, companies are producing. Uh, but I think it applies more broadly. I think companies really deserve a lot of attention, quite simply because they have a key role in this ecosystem for the SDGs. Uh, companies can produce products that can support an SDG, for instance, uh, producing sustainable transport technologies or uh, producing renewable energy related technologies. Companies also are drivers of innovation, both in terms of products and services that they deliver, but also in, the, in terms of the way that they produce. So again, thinking about, for instance, the circular economy. Companies furthermore are drivers of uh, financing. They allo allocate financing around the world and that can be supportive of the SDGs, of course, as well. Uh, but I think what's also very important to acknowledge is that companies have a lot of negative impacts on the SDGs. Think, for instance, about climate change. Uh, to give you one statistic, it's been estimated that since the 1970s, about 100 companies, so just on, only 100 companies, have been uh, responsible for about 70% of all greenhouse gas emissions that have been emitted. Have been emitted. And of course, uh, that is a key reason for uh, global warming. Now, the good news, I think, in this whole context is that the unique role of the private sector is actually acknowledged by the United Nations. So when the SDGs were adopted and in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, what's highlighted there is that the United Nations is explicitly saying that they call upon the private sector uh, and all types of businesses around the world to really contribute towards achieving the SDGs. So what is then to be done and how can companies uh, create consumption and production patterns that are actually supportive of the SDGs? I think here what, what we all need to do and, and, and what we need to understand is that of all the millions of companies in the world, companies can have very different impacts. And we first need to understand how all of these unique companies have unique impacts on different and multiple SDGs and that these impacts can be both positive and negative. So what I believe is that we can create four different typologies of companies uh, that will give us that understanding. And the first of uh, that type of company is really the type of company that is core to achieving the SDGs. Such core companies have a lot of positive impacts, but very few negative impacts. So think about uh, a renewable energy utility, lots of positive impacts, really critical to achieving various of the SDGs with relatively a uh, few negative externalities. So those will be the very positive, the core companies. But then we also have opposed companies, the second typology. And opposed companies have a lot of negative impacts, but they don't contribute a lot of positive effects. Think about a tobacco company, or maybe think about, uh, for instance, a fossil fuel company. Really, the what such companies need to do is really to think about transforming their business models to become more sustainable. So a good example here is, uh, for instance, Dong Energy. Dong Energy used to be a um, the Danish oil and gas company, a national company. But about a decade or so ago, they reviewed their business model and they made a total change. So instead of focusing on oil and natural gas, they really shifted towards uh, renewable energy. And today they are known as Orsted, one of the biggest renewable energy companies in the world. Then the third typology is what I call mixed companies. So companies with both a lot of positive and a lot of negative effects. Think for instance about companies producing steel or cement, really critical towards uh, SDG 9 on, on infrastructure, for instance, uh, or SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. We also need a lot of raw materials, but producing steel or cement uh, comes with a lot of negative environmental externalities. 
So here the imperative for such companies is to really think about how can you still deliver the positive effects, uh, but also to reduce your negative impacts. So for a cement company, for instance, uh, a lot of the adverse environmental impact is coming from greenhouse gas emissions. It's very energy intensive to produce cement. So there a company can think about using recycled materials as input and about changing the energy sources towards using more renewables in the production process. The fourth and final uh, typology that I would like to mention here is then uh, peripheral activities. So companies uh, undertaking economic activities that don't really have a lot of positive effects, but also don't really cost a lot. Think about uh, an IT services company, for instance, doesn't really contribute too much in general to the SDGs, but also doesn't cost a lot, doesn't create a lot of negative impacts. So what we can then do if we understand better which SDGs are impacted by companies and to what extent these impacts are positive and negative, uh, we can encourage companies to really prioritize creating more positive effects, to focus on interlinkages between the goals that they have a positive impact on and other goals that uh, are closely related to, that, to those SDGs so that companies can target multiple SDGs at the same time, but also to uh, encourage them to reduce negative impacts and to minimize the trade-offs that they have. So in my daily work then, um, to, give, to give you an example of how I'm using all of this in, in my daily work, uh, in my daily work, we're looking at thousands of companies that we might be investing in. So we're investing in uh, listed equity uh, or fixed income issued by companies. And what we do is we analyze companies' impacts on the SDG. So we have a framework that determines if companies have positive or negative impacts on each of these uh, 17 SDGs and the 169 underlying targets. And once we create our impact assessment, we give each company an SDG score, a total SDG score that is signaling if the company overall is supportive of the SDGs or if it's negatively impacting on the SDGs. What we then do is we can create investment portfolios that, for instance, only invest in companies with positive impact, uh, or we can go to the companies that we invest in and we explain to them where we see negative impacts and we want to encourage those companies to uh, reduce or even avoid all of these negative impacts that are occurring. So that gives us for about 12,000 companies a really good perspective on where positive and negative impacts are arising, which SDGs are impacted by which types of companies. And what we recently embarked on and what I want to share with uh, everyone here as well is that we are now publishing these SDG scores. We are, as I said, an investment management company. We're not a data provider, but we have a lot of data and a lot of knowledge. So what we are doing since uh, August, 2022 is we are sharing all of these SDG scores that we create for unique companies with our clients, uh, with important stakeholders and with academics as well uh, in order to help everyone get a better understanding of how companies are impacting the world and therefore how we can encourage and nudge companies to become uh, more responsible in their consumption patterns but also in the way that they produce the types of services they deliver and the innovation that they are embarking on in order to become more uh, sustainable in the future. So with an eye on the time I'd like to leave it at that but thank you so much for uh, for joining. And, thank, you. Uh, thank you so much for sticking with us uh, extra long. Uh, now I'd like to uh, move on to Gemma Scott. Gemma, thank you. We know you're uh, pressed for time, so I'll let you do a very quick intro and uh, have your words. Thank you. Great. Um, yeah, thank you ever so much for having me. Really appreciate it. Great opportunity to talk to you all about a, a kind of grassroots project that we've been operating in London. Just a little bit of background on me. Um, I'm a circular economy specialist. I've been working in the waste industry for over 20 years now, um, holding kind of operational and strategic roles, uh, both London-wide and within London local government. Most recently, I've worked for an organisation called ReLondon, uh, and they are a partnership of the Mayor of London and the London boroughs, the 33 London boroughs, to improve uh, waste and resource management and to transform the city into a leading low carbon circular economy. Like I said before, <clears throat> what I'd like to talk to you about today um, is a grassroots project um, to improve residential recycling and waste um, in urban areas. Um, I think it's worth saying that the issue of waste generation and management in cities is really significant um, and one that is replicated the world over. Uh, households in the less developed cities tend to produce 
less waste and have more informal micro scale arrangements for managing it. Whereas <clears throat> more developed cities tend to produce significantly more waste and have um, macro scale arrangements um, for managing that. So my experiences in London uh, were until last year, <clears throat> excuse me, I oversaw the city's activities to improve recycling performance in residential multiple occupancy buildings. Um, and it's worth saying that even in a city like London, um, there's still um, an inequality of access to waste and recycling provision and real disparities in terms of recycling performance, um, which tends to be driven by the type of property um, that you live in. So, for example, houses tend to have what we would call uh, a curbside or doorstep collection of multi-materials with their own bin or trash can. Uh, whereas multiple occupancy buildings, so flats, apartments, estates, those kind of uh, types of buildings, um, which I'm going to be talking to you about today, they tend to have communal collections, um, often in awkward locations with a less choice of materials to recycle. So it's, it's worth pointing out those uh, uh, inequality of access. So increasing recycling performance in London uh, became a priority for the mayor of London. Um, to help com combat global climate change. Uh, we knew that a large and increasing proportion of Londoners lived in multiple occupancy buildings. And we also knew that people who lived in flats recycled much less than those people who lived in houses. And it's up to 50% up to less actually, so quite significant. Um, despite this huge disparity in performance, we didn't know exactly why this was or, or even how we might improve it. And so we began a program of work to find out. Um, over the next four years, and that was between 2018 and 2022, I set up two grassroots um, small scale partnership projects to better understand what the barriers were for people to recycling who live in flats um, and to discover what practical measures we could take um, to help overcome them. Uh, the key to the success of this project was that it focused on understanding from the residents themselves what really deterred people in flats from recycling uh, and then use that information to co-create the improvements to the services that were provided to them. The project um, it's, was the, actually the first of its kind in the UK to include in-depth um, what we call ethnographic research with residents so actually speaking to residents in their own homes, we even had um, quite it might sound quite strange, but we even had uh, video cameras in people's kitchens to understand what their behaviours were when it came to waste, obviously with their approval. Um, and the project uh, as well was the first, the first of its kind in the UK to include very comprehensive measurement of the amount and composition of waste so that we were able to provide really good evidence on the outcomes that we were finding. Um, from the research um, that we did um, with those residents, we discovered that the key to improving performance centred around making it easier for residents to recycle, motivating them to recycle and improving their knowledge around what can and cannot be recycled. And there were five guiding principles that we used to design the interventions um, uh, on these in these estates. Uh, the first being um, making multiple connected changes to, to help disrupt existing habits, uh, making the services bold and prominent and highly visible, ensuring that the new services solved people's problems, um, providing an end-to-end -end solution, so including kind of home infrastructure as well as um, the, the journey to the, to the container, the bin itself, um, and starting with a big bang launch and then continuing with ongoing prompts. Um, using all of this information that we gathered, we designed and rolled out a package of measures that's known as the Flats Recycling Package, and that included new high quality operational waste and recycling services alongside excellent communications. And we had some really impressive results, um, including significant increases in recycling um, and 152 uh, percent on average um, increases in recycling. So pretty amazing. I think in summary, uh, what I can what I can tell in, tell you in terms of what we learned is that by listening to residents themselves and co-creating the waste services with them was what led to those significant significant improvements, especially with those, those residents who were already motivated to recycle. Now you probably remember 
earlier that was the kind of three key things um, that we found from the search that would help re people recycle more and that was making it easier moting, motivating them and giving them the right knowledge um, I think it's fair to say that one of the things that was less successful about the project was engaging and motivating those who were non-recyclers um, so that was a that was a key and continues to be a key issue for, for us um, in London um, more information on the project can be found on the ReLondon website, um, including a toolkit and some downloadable assets um, to replicate the success in other cities across the globe. And I will post that in the chat shortly. Um, lastly, I thought you might be interested to know that um, in London, through an organisation who we used to work for called ReLondon, they're delivering a number of grassroots projects, um, not only to improve community infrastructure, but also working to achieve circularity um, at a community and a neighbourhood level. Um, and I will put a, put a link to some of the work that they're doing um, in the chat um, once I've finished. Thank you ever so much, Charles. Um, and back to you. I hope that was a, a useful, more kind of grassroots, less strategic look at how we can bring about change. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Gemma. Uh, that's brilliant. Uh, David, over to you now. Uh, thank you, Gemma. Before you leave, uh, I think the lot, if anyone on this call is uh, from a municipal waste management company, you probably want to talk to Gemma about the UK London experiment. Um, one of the interesting questions she raises, how do you motivate those who are not inclined to recycle in the first place? Uh, various schemes use incentives of one sort or another. I don't know whether this one did, but in any case, I guess we'll hear more uh, at some point. Um, so let's move on now to our last speaker before we wrap up. Uh, Luca Cosieme. Uh, Luca, I guess you're going to introduce yourself, program lead for sustainable lifestyles at Hotter Cold, which is a think tank based in uh, Netherlands, I believe. Is it? Berlin. In Berlin. In Berlin. In Berlin. Okay. Yeah, yeah please. Luca. Nearby. Nearby. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, Thank, thanks so much, David, uh, and thanks for inviting me to all of the panelists. Um, so I, I've been uh, kind of suggested to talk about uh, the trade-offs that exist uh, across the, the SDGs, uh, but also to be uh, as solution-oriented as possible. So that's what I'm trying to do. Um, and I'm afraid I would have to start from uh, slightly confusing what was said by uh, the UN, or, or, or one of the points that the UN uh, uh, Deputy Director uh, uh, spoke about, which is how uh, the SDGs support one another. Uh, although this would be, of course, ideal, this is not what we are observing today. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what research is showing is that uh, the achievement of some of the SDGs uh, uh, can actually limit the possibilities for, for others to achieve uh, some of the other SDGs. Um, and of course, the, the elephant in the room here is uh, in particular SDG 8 and how it is framed uh, and, and the use, uh, still the reliance of, of GDP uh, uh, as a measure of progress uh, towards the achievement of, of that goal at the very least. Um, so this, uh, this gave me also the opportunity to flag uh, the Beyond Grow conference that is going to take place in May at the European Parliament, uh, from which I hope we could have uh, uh, some indication as to uh, you know, how to uh, fix that issue, which is causing some of the incoherence we are seeing uh, uh, in the SDGs and in how we measure uh, sustainable development. Uh, why this is important for SDG 12? Uh, it is important because this incoherence, uh, uh, in fact, regards SDG 12 in particular, I would say. Uh, on the one hand, uh, as also uh, reminded in the SDG uh, progress report uh, of this year, uh, we know that uh, SDG 12 is fundamental uh, because um, the crisis, the planetary crisis we are living, which are you know, biodiversity, uh, climate, uh, and pollution crisis uh, uh, from an environmental perspective, they are all largely driven by how we uh, produce and how we consume. So on the one hand, we have that. And on the other hand, we have lots of evidence that show that uh, countries that perform very well on most of the other SDGs uh, perform poorly on SDG 12. Um, like one of my favorite uh, studies showing that is a paper published by Matthias Wagenagel, uh, I believe in 2017, 
where he uh, basically uh, showed how all of the countries uh, are scoring higher on the SDG index uh, are also the ones with a higher carbon footprint uh, and a higher material footprint. So there is still a tight uh, link uh, between high consumption levels and, uh, and how we uh, perceive and measure progress. Uh, and this is really a lock-in we have to overcome uh, if we really want to measure development that is sustainable. Um, so moving towards maybe what could be the solutions uh, to some of these inconsistencies we are seeing, um, I think that, um, yeah, if I can use the uh, uh, maybe overused um, metaphor of the airplane, we do need a dashboard uh, of indicators to uh, understand complex issues such as um, sustainable development uh, or development, uh, but we also need to know where we are going. Uh, so we do uh, need to have an overarching goal, which is a better, uh, 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 better implementing that than, than what it is now in the SDGs. Um, then another another solution uh, which I think we should look at uh, is uh, uh, to build uh, uh, aggregate measures um, that uh, take into account or places more weight to resource security, uh, which is uh, both. Uh, a key element uh, uh, um, to which SDG 11 and 12 speak. Um, and then uh, another important element of what is, uh, I believe, a, um, a possible improvement of next uh, sustainable development monitoring uh, frameworks uh, would be to uh, switch the narrative from one that is focused on trying to uh, uh, be as good as possible and trying to uh, increase well-being within uh, uh, environmental thresholds to an, an idea that is slightly different, which is uh, trying to ensure that everybody uh, uh, feels their need uh, with the minimum environmental impact uh, uh, as possible. Uh, so this means integrated uh, uh, concept of sufficiency into how we measure sustainable development and sufficiency consumption levels uh, that would allow them um, to free up uh, resources and carbon budget, uh, for example, for developing countries uh, to reach their basic needs. Um, it is central to this, uh, the work we and many others are doing on, on changing lifestyles. Uh, this was also, uh, um, I think, reminded by uh, Marusha and some of the other uh, uh, panelists. Um, what we're seeing in lifestyle research is that changes in lifestyle are really important. Uh, but they have to be enabled by changes in the in the structure that 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 frame consumption. So uh, it, there is really uh, uh, not a dichotomy between uh, what we can achieve by consumption uh, behavior change and what are uh, changes in the structure of the system that we need. Uh, but these two things have to happen together. It can happen only if they do happen together. Uh, and I will conclude just reminding uh, also of the importance in taking into account. Uh, uh, the inequality of consumption um, into uh, uh, how we understand and measure um, sustainable development. Um, thank you. Thanks very much, Luca, for that. Um, so I guess uh, we're now basically out of time, but we want to have our final uh, uh intervention by the director of stakeholder forums so charles will you introduce uh, irena please well I, as it happens david irena has not been able to stay with us uh, like many others i thought i just saw her oh she just left okay yeah she said she had to leave at 10. uh mm -hmm. so i think um what we'll do in respect to the fact that we've gone over we do still have about uh, over almost 120 uh participants uh with us so I suppose uh, one question I would ask our, our panel, uh, if some of the panel can stick around, would you please activate your uh, cameras so I could see? But if you can't, you know, certainly we'll understand that. Um, this way, you know, we have sort of a gallery view uh, and uh, we'll all be on. Um, and I, I what I'll do is I'm not gonna say what Irena would have said in terms of a wrap up. What I would say is I've answered a number of the questions in the Q&A uh, box. Um, there are a couple questions still in there. All of you can see that. If you want to take a quick look 
uh, you know, Luca and Z um, Zenat uh, and Jan Gustav. Uh, and uh, we also have, uh, I see we have uh, Fernando with us. If you wouldn't mind having a quick look at the handful, you know, three or four questions that are still there. Uh, one of them is in, uh, is I believe in uh, French. Uh, is anyone a French speaker? If not, I'll do a quick translation uh, and see if it might be something that uh, can be answered. Uh, uh, one question is how can we integrate the major groups to give our contributions as the evaluation report of the SDGs in Senegal is re that's realized by civil society. It's important to strengthen the networking. Now, young know, Gustav, you're you know a, a keen have keen knowledge of uh, major groups and their contributions to the various systems. Maybe could you just give us a couple of words on that? Oh, my young Gustav, you're muted. Yes, I was too eager. Sorry. Yes, thank you, Charles. Uh, well, first of all, the major groups are integrated. Uh, they do have uh, rights and obligations through the resolutions that have given a mandate to the high-level political forum. Uh, the question there is if they can afford to go there. But, you know, uh, most of the uh, these uh, sessions at HLPF are also online. Uh, so direct transmission is possible. The other place where, as we speak about Africa here, where major groups are also integrated is with UNEP and UNEP's regional offices all over the world. So it's just a question of getting your formalities in order and then your knowledge and your, your interest will be appreciated. So that's that's the simple question as we're running over time. Uh, sorry, the simple answer. Thank, thank just, you, young Gustav. Yeah. Appreciate that. Um, I'm gonna answer one question. Does anybody else wanna jump in with an answer before I answer one of them? No hands raised. Um, one question is to do with, we still need uh, much work for recycling issues and chemicals industries. What are the solutions? Now, I, I'm a waste manager, but my, I don't have a specialty in uh, chemicals. However, uh, uh, if you go onto the UNEP website, there is a section on chemicals. U UNEP being the environmental arm, so to speak, of the United Nations is focused on uh, environmental issues. In particular, there's, a, there's lots that they do in terms of chemicals. So I would say to Ahmed, if you're still with us, Take a look at the UNEP website. Um, there's a lot of progress being made with recovering of materials. For instance, you know, there's been concern over the electric cars, which I happen to be an electric car driver. And one of the biggest issues is what are we going to do with all the electric car batteries? Well, actually, the big legacy manufacturers have actually now three or four of them have developed systems to recover up to 95% of the uh, materials, including the heavy metals from uh, automotive uh, car batteries, electric car batteries when they are retired. So there's progress, it's very expensive. And of course the big issue with everything is how it's gonna be funded. Uh, so that's uh, the quick answer to that. Um, folks, if none of you are ready to jump in to answer any of the other questions, I will then wrap up. Uh, and just apologize to the remaining audience that we haven't been able to answer all questions. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, I'll just have a few final uh, comments. Uh, I'm going to share the screen uh, because we just have, we want you to know about uh, what's coming up next uh, with our webinars. Uh, I want to say thanks to all of you for joining us today and a huge thanks to David O'Connor and Jan Gustav Strandenes uh, for their um, for their participation, David for moderating, and in particular our keynote speaker who stepped in at the last minute uh, to cover for his executive director and especially to the panel. Uh, we made some of you stay longer than promised. The content's been fantastic, very rich. We're going to be summarizing this. Uh, the uh, webinar has been recorded. That recording will be posted as a video and audio podcast on the Stakeholder Forum website. You will all receive a link tomorrow morning from the Zoom platform, or an email, I should say, with a link to those uh, details into those uh, do, to the video and to the audio. Uh, in addition, uh, you know the stakeholder forum team will be preparing a summary of this uh, past webinars and future webinars for input to the United Nations SDG Summit in 2020 September 2023. In closing, I hope you join us on May 25th for the seventh in SF series of Countdown to the UN. SDG Summit 2023 webinars, where we will highlight SDGs 13 and 14, climate action and life below water. Uh, we'll send out joining instructions soon. Until then, thank you so very much. Uh, stay safe and goodbye.
Thank you, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.